All right, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to the discussion on the future of energy. Uh, I think I've probably inter been introduced a few times, but uh, I'm John Wagner, lab director at Idaho National Laboratory. I will try not to eat up much of the time so we can hear from our, our panelists here. Uh, we've had a couple of changes of plans. So um, Greg Hess uh, had surgery, and, uh, and unfortunately, he was even so determined, by the way, as we had a prep call on Monday that he was even going to join us remotely from the from the hospital. But given that he he hasn't been able to do that, he must be in considerable pain. So, um, you know, so best wishes to, to Greg and in, in his recovery uh, from his surgery, he was able to join us. So Sharon Fain from Pacific Corp graciously uh, agreed not very long ago, maybe an hour or two, um, to, uh, to fill in uh, on Greg's behalf. So thank you, Sharon. Um, and uh, all along, well, at least for a while, we've been planning on having former Governor David Frenthal, probably pronounced his name wrong, uh, join us as well. Both have very deep perspective here on energy from very different uh, kind, of, uh, kind of perspectives. So we're very fortunate to have them both. Um, obviously the future of energy is going to look quite different than it is currently. We're gonna see a lot of different sources working together regionally dependent on what those mixes look like. Obviously it needs to be secure, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be resilient. Um, and then there's a lot of different aspects, whether it's from a utility perspective or a policymaker perspective on what that might look like. So let's just, let's just dive in. What, I, what I'd like to do first is have each of you, Sharon and, and Dave, just, just a brief introduction and remarks, and then we'll go into a series of questions. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I've met many of you over the last day or so, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here this afternoon. Um, I'm Sharon Fain, for those of you uh, that I haven't met, um, Vice President of Pacific Core here in Wyoming. I'm based in Cheyenne, and I've worked with several of you on some economic development projects and some of our Energy Vision 2020 uh, projects. Um, we are a, uh, a Berkshire Hathaway energy-owned company. We're the largest electric utility in Wyoming, and we serve six states. Our main office is in, South, in uh, Salt Lake, Rocky Mountain Power, and then Pacific Power, which is in Portland, Oregon. So uh, for many of you who maybe haven't seen a recent headline, uh, the Bureau of Land Management and Department of Interior have just approved our $2.2 billion transmission line, Gateway South, which will run from Medicine Bow, Wyoming, to Mona, Utah. And I'm pleased to say that Several of you will be at our groundbreaking on Monday in Carbon County. So a lot of work going on with our company, investments in Wyoming, investments across the West on ensuring that we have transmission and safe, reliable service for our customers, but also facilitating a very safe and secure uh, energy future for not only the state, but the nation. So pleased to be with you and happy to answer any questions you may have about our initiatives. I'm uh, Dave Friedenthal, I'm an attorney in Cheyenne. Um, I started dealing with these energy issues in 19, January 7th, 1975, or actually before that, after I graduated from college, came back to Wyoming, it was the beginning of the manifestations of um, Nixon's project independence when uh, we were gonna shift heavily over to, uh, to coal, um, worked for governor, uh, practice law, worked for mostly energy companies, was a governor, and now I'm back uh, practicing law. And I think the, the perspective I have is um, of being in a state um, that is kind of at the end of a long whip of energy policy. Uh, that is, we feel the consequences, but we don't control how the whip is moving. And I've lived through, um, you know, Nixon's big end, project independence push, then Ford came in with project sufficiency or energy sufficiency. Um, then Carter had the uh, Energy Mobilization Board, the Synth Synthetic Fuels Corporation. Um, then Reagan came in. Uh, uh, finally, somebody, in, he, he would have ended anyway, but he ended uh, uh, price controls on, uh, on gas and oil. Uh, so then his, lar his policy was largely um, benign neglect. Uh, which was really the pattern in the United States up through the 50s when Eisenhower started the original oil quotas. Um, all of that ripples through um, a place like Wyoming, which 
produces, we're the largest net energy producer, not the largest energy producer, but the net largest net energy producer in the country. Then we have you know, uranium, oil and gas, coal, um, variety of other minerals. So uh, each of those policies then would kind of roll through and then, um, um, you know, then, then Bush too kind of got engaged with the uh, uh, production tax credit, which modified the landscape quite a bit in energy. And of course, um, if you've been here for a day, you know that we have plenty of wind. Um, and that the, the perceptions that I have are from somebody who is down the chain, but understands the impact that ends up on us is way off over here with a combination of policy and um, private sector energy company decisions. Thank you, Governor. Uh, let's start with a couple of questions here. Can each of you share your perspectives on the energy transition? Uh, it's, we've talked a lot uh, throughout this about we're kind of at a pivotal moment relative to energy transition. So I'd appreciate your thoughts from your different perspectives. And, and how do you see it unfolding with respect to the roles of things like oil and gas and renewables? So for us specifically, I'd like to touch base on a conversation some of us have had, but not more broadly, is that the energy transition, it's not only business, obviously, and energy related, but there's a very big human component to that. And the governor, um, I'm sure he can share a, a lot about his experiences in the small towns that will be impacted by the closure of coal plants, uh, the transition and the, the introduction of the new advanced nuclear demonstration project in Cameron, Wyoming. So for us, because uh, we are the utility that's planning to transition some of these units to natural gas, but also close some coal units uh, due to several items we've discussed here, um, we have an obligation to make sure we're supporting the communities and the workforce that are impacted by that transition. So for us, we're reimbursing our employees if they choose to uh, get a college degree or a new certification, we'll reimburse them for that cost. Uh, we're also working with communities to secure economic development administration matching funds to uh, undergo some in, uh, in economic diversification studies and then execute those programs. So for us as a utility doing business in Wyoming for more than 100 years, we're not closing our gates and texting our employees not to show up. There's an obligation and a responsibility. So that um, led to my receiving a certif certification through Harvard Kennedy School and the International Economic Development Council to become a certified economic developer to help these communities through the transition. With regard to the transition, it will be much slower than the advocates want and much faster than the opponents uh, would desire. And Wyoming has both. Um, and it's, um, I mean, you've got, um, I mean, that, that we're about to what, double, maybe triple the wind energy produced in Wyoming here in the next four or five years. Um, coal was um, 486 million tons. Um, in the mid uh, 2000s, it's down to about 218 now. Um, and that has the reverber reverberations through the, uh, the communities and the tax structure. Um, but my view about it is very straightforward, which is um, people are gonna fight both politically and financially over uh, what shape it's gonna be. So it's a little hard to predict. Uh, the government will muck around. Um, uh, Biden will be replaced. Uh, who knows who will be replaced by, um, and they will all kind of moderate or accelerate the transition depending on uh, the government's predisposition and whether or not they can master uh, Congress, which basically at this point can't pass gas. Um, and uh, uh, so it's not going to be what anybody expects. People who probably have the best sense of what's going to be are the private sector players. And the way you read what they're thinking is look at their advertising. They spend millions of dollars trying to figure out what they need to say to people so people will feel good about their company. Um, you don't see coal mines in advertisements anymore. Um, in the 80s, you would see advertisements from Kansas City Power and Light about digging a big hole in Wyoming and moving coal to power plants in, uh, in their area. What you see now is um, everything is green. Uh, we're the greenest company. The advertisement you saw before, they said they were green, but they're not as green as us. 
Um, you know, we're facilitating electric cars, we're facilitating the transition. Um, and so to me, what they recognize is that this transition is gonna be supported by the consumer. Now there'll be pushback in various places, particularly places like Wyoming, um, but in the end, it's going to occur. And the question that I haven't figured out is whether there's enough adult behavior in the government sector to facilitate that um, occurring uh, with uh, some degree of, um, or with, with less disruption than is potentially available. And I, and I say that advisedly, I'm not sure energy policy ought to be left to the government because it changes too much. We've had, everybody says we've never had an energy policy. That's not right. We've had way too many and they've changed too fast and they have not been consistent. One of the interesting things to me is production tax credit has been extended 12 times under both Democratic and Republican Congresses and administrations. And that should confirm, I think, in everybody's mind that either they have really good lobbyists, which they do, but what they really understand is this transition is real and it's gonna to have to be facilitated. But there are very few elements of uh, helping facilitate this transition through either research, joint research between the private public sector that can facilitate it. There are very, very few of those that actually are sustained over a period of years. And everybody knows that these projects, they don't get developed the day they come in and ask for a permit. Somebody has had to do an awful lot of work to get it together. I mean, development of fracking took forever. Uh, and then all of a sudden we said, oh no, my heavens, this is all brand new. It really wasn't. You could see it evolving and some of it was with government assistance. But my point would be that what I fear about the transition is that as long as it is an argument among politicians, that it will be essentially uh, a disruptive process because of the ebb and flow of who is in power. So Dave, you just spoke a little bit to how it's been. Um, I'd be curious on both your perspective on what government policies perhaps should be changed to accelerate the transition, to ensure affordable, um, clean electricity and, and power to consumers. Uh, you know, maybe even think about if you were king or queen, uh, what, what would you what would you suggest? Well, first, I'd like to say if there's any media in the room, the gas comment and grown up comment about the government of the government belongs to him, not me. <laughs> and I gladly own it. <laughs> so thank you for that. Truth um, is my defense. So so those of you who were not in our in our breakout uh, group one um, may not have heard this, but the transmission line that we're breaking ground on Monday it took 12 years to permit. Um, the Bureau of Land Management uh, PR person said, well, Sharon, I wanna tell you this off the record that I started, my, my child was born uh, when you started the permitting process and now he's doing the final press release on their approval. So obviously there's some regulatory challenges when it comes to implementing not only technologies, but the, the construction of infrastructure to ensure that we have that uh, secure energy future. Well, I, I got to respond to that. You need to be careful about it. And, and I have clients who do it and I've done it about how long it takes to do an EIS and get something permitted. We have to understand that that particular project was reconfigured at least twice or maybe three times during my time in office. So there's a, this, there's a, there's a shared responsibility and I'm not making apologies for BLM uh, because I, I don't know if you can't apologize enough for them. Um, that if I were if I were able to do it, what I would do is I would um, create a sustainable fund. I mean, Jimmy Carter wasn't wrong uh, when he tried to do the Synthetic Fuels Corporation in that context. I mean, they were talking about coal conversion and, all, and their own kind of how do you meet demand as opposed to now when we're trying to meet demand and environmental goals, but it never worked because it wasn't allowed to play itself out. And so it starts with a 80 billion, 80 billion authorization um, and then ends in less than four years. And so you've got to have sustained financial commitment from the government. And then you got to have sustained financial commitment from the private sector, which the government can also facilitate um, with tax credits. I would probably modify the production tax credit a little bit uh, so that 
Um, it, it, I mean, it seems to work in that by virtue of the fact that you only get the credit if it's spinning and, it, and people then try to get more power out of it, uh, it seems to ins have incentivized a great deal of technological advance in the operation of those uh, windmills of the, of the turbines. But what worries me is that um, if we don't figure out a way to have, have a sustained policy that lasts more than either the next congressional election or the next presidential election, this thing is, is going to be fits and starts. And without that, um, and I don't see that coming together because energy, part of the problem in this country is since um, oh, probably the 50s, this country has expected cheap and plentiful food, cheap and plentiful energy. We provided the food through a variety of egg subsidies and, and other kinds of operations. We've subsidized certain forms of energy. And uh, so people at the pump would be astonished if they went to Europe and saw what people have been paying for energy for a long, long time. And so the public may not be willing, uh, although in the end they're gonna have to just because the way the system's gonna work. The, the, they live with the price spikes, but every time I fill my truck, but oh my God, it's not an electric. Uh, but I'm not sure that F-150 is gonna be what it's supposed to be. But if it is, I'll probably get one. Um, what, what you end up saying is, well, you know, it goes up, it comes down and, you know, in a year, uh, it'll be back down to, you know, three bucks or, you know, 290. Well, I don't know that that's necessarily true. And I don't, I don't blame anybody for it. It's just the way the world's sorting out. So in, the, in addition to sort of, uh, what we need to do, we need to begin to educate the public of the cost of energy as it, depending on how you measure it, um, you can measure it in terms of environmental consequences, you can measure it in terms of costs, you can measure it in terms of social impacts, but somehow we have to begin to understand that the cost of energy is higher than we've been paying. And I don't know whether we can get the public there because only if that happens, Will you be in a position where politicians can't use uh, the price at the pump uh, as a sword against whoever's in office? Uh, and that's, you know, it's not just the Republicans who do it. The Democrats did it uh, because what you do is you figure out what people are irritated about, and obviously it's the other guy's fault. So the absence of a sustained policy is going to make this extremely difficult and extremely prone. I mean, if if we if we hadn't had the infrastructure bill and some of the other money that became available that's now being distributed through the Department of Energy and some of the other projects, there's a lot of research and innovation that would not occur. However, it, when the parties flip, the other party has um, every reason to do the opposite of what the incumbent party did, because by God, we told the voters we weren't gonna do anything those dumb people did when they were in office. But other than that, I'm entirely neutral on the future. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let me pull out a, just a piece of that, um, and you kind of talked about technology, and let's talk about technology and innovation and what that means to the future of the energy landscape, and, and Sharon, you mentioned uh, just very briefly your uh, Pacific Corps project down in Kimmer, Wyoming. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, that would be a TerraPower nuclear, advanced nuclear reactor uh, down there with the, uh, with the goal of repurposing an existing coal plant site. I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Obviously, uh, Dave, if you want to speak to that as well, and then broaden it to other technologies that maybe uh, you all might be interested in or, or think are promising relative to the energy transition. So I want to clarify, it's TerraPower's project, and then when it becomes commercially viable, used, and useful, it will become purchased by Pacific Power or Pacific Core. It's really no different than uh, a wind developer uh, constructing a wind farm, and then we purchase that as a resource for our customers. So um, it was an opportunity for the community that was going through a transition, the not in power plant. Uh, we converted one of the units to natural gas, but two or three of the others were scheduled for closure. And we had about 85 team members there that would have been impacted. Um, the Terra power plant is about two miles away. So it won't repurpose or redevelop the uh, power plant itself, but it will utilize the infrastructure that's in place. Uh, it's a cost savings, which we're, we're looking forward to. Um, the price tag for TerraPower right now is between four to $6 billion. 
Um, that's today. Um, but we will purchase that at a, a commercial rate or a rate that we believe is best, obviously, for our company and our customers. So looking forward to that development um, and the TerraPower investment in Kemmer. And again, uh, reskilling and, and working with that re the, uh, the workers that are impacted, Bechtel, the contractor, to, uh, to work with that workforce and see where there might be a good fit for them but also realistic that there's some people who may not want to be reskilled and, and, and located there at the Terra Power Plant. So you have to be very uh, aware of that. And, and I know that Dave has some comments on that as well. But again, you know, we're committed to communities we're serving and the workforce that we have to make sure we're doing everything, including relocation, reskilling for those that are impacted by the coal transition. Uh, I actually think you guys are doing a great job. I mean, Thank you. I That's mean, on the record anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I, unfortunately, the best tool pool hall in Kimmerer closed about 10 years ago. Um, I think that project gives us a sense of the scale of investment that's going to be needed. Um, whether it's this sort of capturing CO2 out of the air, whether it's capture of um, uh, CO2 emissions and storage and utilization. Um, and frankly, uh, the scale of that investment is is as important as the sustained nature of it. Um, you know, we, we um, I don't know how many different presidential candidates have talked about, we're gonna do a moonshot for whatever purpose, whether it's fighting cancer or some energy thing or whatever. Um, and, you know, we really, if it was a moonshot, I don't know that we ever got much higher than a firecracker. Um, the point being that what they're doing there, I think, I think it's a great idea and a great project, and you hope it works. But we got to understand that it's going to be expensive, and it may or may not work the way everybody expects. And that's the, that's the other problem with government-assisted funding, is that the public um, is informed by the opposition every time one of those investments fails. Because the government is expected to succeed 100% of the time with its investments. Nobody in the private sector expects to succeed 100% of the time. If you're a venture capitalist, three out of 10, and if they make a lot, you're, you're good. Unfortunately, the measurement against government investments tends to be, well, you may have had 20 good ones, but all we're gonna talk about is the one that failed or the one that there was some crook in. I mean, I spent eight years as US attorney. There are plenty of crooks in the world. We don't catch them all. Um, uh, we, you know, so don't, we have to have a different perception of the outcome of those investments. We have to have sustained support for them. And it has to be big dollars. I, I know I'm going to offend the president and, and our sitting governor, but what Wyoming's doing on this coal capture and sequestration and stuff, it's a drop in the bucket, 27 million, maybe 30. I mean, we can say we're doing something, but it's not at the scale that you need. It's not at the scale that's gonna succeed. Um, but as a political matter, it has to be done in Wyoming. Legislature gave the coal industry a $10 million tax break, makes no difference. Um, it, it, what, I'm, what I'm arguing for is you need a rational discussion about policy. It needs to be long-term. It has to be well-funded. And we have to understand that not all of it's gonna work. And the first time something fails, you can't say, well, let's say this uh, uh, reactor project out in Southwest Wyoming doesn't meet the hype and the expectations. Let's say that it's only 75%. Then somebody's gonna come along and say, well, it failed. Um, it didn't fail. Thank you. At the risk of schedule, I'm gonna try to squeeze one more real quick one in. Um, and that no, I only, I, only, I only agreed you could pay me for half an hour. Sharon, you'll help me here, I'm sure. Um, and it, it, it really keep them brief. I, I, I did promise you that. Um, the, how has the energy outlook changed quickly from your perspective with respect to the events uh, of Russia attacking Ukraine? So several of our customers, industrial customers in Wyoming are oil and gas companies. We are seeing a renewed interest in not only expansion for, um, for development and production, but also investment in some, some different uh, processing stations. So we're seeing increased activity at the oil and gas sector in Wyoming. I mean, the, 
the, there's going to be increased activity, but, um, you know, but, uh, oil's, I don't know, $118, $120 a barrel. You can make money in Wyoming at 45 maybe. Um, and we still have fewer drilling rigs active in Wyoming than we had um, pre-pandemic. And my point is this, you're gonna see a great deal more oil and gas development, at least I hope, uh, but you're gonna see it in the places where the companies can command the greatest margin. So places like Wyoming, where the geology is not all that good and you know there's weather problems. I mean, you can drill year round in Texas. Here it gets a little tough in the winter. So you're gonna see that increase, but it is not gonna be uniformly spread across the country. I think you're gonna see um, a greater interest in other forms of energy development. Um, I think hopefully you know, we, we've begun a sustained effort to try to capture some of these critical minerals uh, that are gonna be essential. We're way behind the Russians and the Chinese in terms of gaining control of those resources around the world. There are some deposits in America, but they're not the best deposits worldwide. And so we're, we're gonna have some really hard decisions to make. But I think, it, I, I think the consequence of that, of the pandemic, the consequence of that invasion is it's fundamentally changing people's thinking about energy and food. Um, but I don't, know, I don't know where it ends up. All right, I'll, I'll cut it there. Thank you so much. Really insightful comments, candid, which is what I expected. I'm sorry I didn't leave time for questions from the audience, uh, but uh, I'm gonna put them on the hook and say catch them right after this if you, if you have specific questions for them. Thank you to both of you.